it's not by the struggle. Uh, later on, I went to Poland to uh, Czech Republic and had more discussions with them. Uh, well, I think that they understood that civil society was not just the 18th century concept of the rule of law, but something else. It was uh, the notion of horizontal, self-organized uh, groups and institutions in the public sphere. That was what was so important for them, fighting against different forms of ideology. And recent uh, democratic awakenings also around the Arab world and Iran have demonstrated once again that civic actors, civil society uh, can help uh, to provide the independent space uh, that is needed. Uh, and to use uh, Sarah Isaiah Berlin's uh, famous distinction between negative liberty and positive liberty, is a way of fighting more for negative liberty than for uh, positive liberty. So I would say that when we're talking about nonviolent empowerment, nonviolent resistance, nonviolent struggle against uh, uh, against injustice and unjust laws is practically, it would be more or less about freedom from interference and struggle against concentration of arbitrary power. That's what it is all about and it's, that's why it's so important. A nonviolent civil society strategy, if you can call it this way, uh, should assume that democratic passion is not enough to contain civil strife or to make changes. I think that democratic passion, which is very important, and I think that in North America we're losing it terribly, uh, both in Canada and in the US, uh, democratic passion cannot become real democracy until civil society becomes strong enough to uh, resist and control the state from the bottom up. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, we have enough experiences in the past uh, 150 years to know that for sure. In other words, uh, my point is that without nonviolent civic strategy, a democracy is lame. But without democracy, I would say also, nonviolent civic strategy would be blind. Uh, they both need each other. Uh, you need, I mean, it's not that we can just function in civil society. We do need also uh, democracy to function. Otherwise, it's going to be chaotic. Uh, and I think that uh, many nonviolent activists knew that very well. For example, MLK, who is one of my heroes, and I teach him uh, next to Gandhi and Mandela at UFT, uh, actually in this, uh, here in this house, uh, and my class was practically two hours ago uh, at the University uh, uh, College. Uh, well, Martin Luther King, MLK, knew that very well because uh, when he talks about transforming democracy from thin paper to thick action. This is one of his famous speeches. Uh, transforming democracy from thin paper to thick action. This is exactly what he meant, actually. Uh, this is what uh, he meant, actually. So the philosophical question, uh, but at the same time the political question, because the two are, are very closely linked, uh, that we need to ask, and uh, I, I'm asking it right now to you, is can nonviolence raise people's awareness concerning the absence of justice and equality in contemporary society, and could uh, somehow prepare the possibilities of nonviolent reform? Well, I would like to ask an immediate question, uh, an immediate uh, connection with the, this question, a basic philosophical question, a basic ontological question. Uh, the basic ontological question, when I say ontology, I mean the uh, science of being, of course, is we usually ask ourselves either religiously, philosophically, spiritually, scientifically, uh, why there is being rather than nothing. This is a famous philosophical question, okay? Why? But I think there is another philosophical question which becomes very, very important uh, for the human race, and that's why there is violence rather than non-violence. Thanks to our being uh, and non-being, nothingness, why there is violence rather than non-violence. Well, uh, 
why uh, we have to ask ourselves why in today's world we have terrorism, we have religious and ethnic uh, fanaticism and rivalries, why do we have environmental deterioration, why do we have economic crises, uh, why do we have unending international hostilities. Uh, all of these point, I think, to a world with global challenges and multiple threats, and it is clear that in such a world, uh, plagued by violence, we have to say it is plagued by violence, we urgently need a philosophy of nonviolence. We urgently need to ask questions about our nonviolent strategies of getting uh, out of it. And it's even more important uh, because of the, <clears throat> I would say, environmental uh, and political schedule. Uh, well, uh, why? Because we have clash of national interests, we have religious uh, fundamentalism, we have ethnic and religious prejudices, uh, and, uh, and, and we, have, we have global warming, we, have, we are destroying the nature, as we can see. So the principle of nonviolence, I think, may be our best bet in laying the groundwork for a new cosmopolis, I would say, for a new cosmopolitan way of looking at our Earth and our, our race, our human race, I think, like that. So, perhaps never in the history of human race, I think that nonviolence has been so crucial. Uh, perhaps because we have never been so powerful to destroy ourselves and to destroy the Earth. So that's why we have to think terribly. And we, unfortunately, many philosophers and scientists and artists thought about that in the 20th century and even before. But I think it has become even more urgent to, to think about it. Uh, but there is also another reason. Why? Because nonviolence has recently evolved from a simple tactic of resistance to a more, I would call it, cosmopolitical aim. It's not just an anti-colonial resistance as we had in Gandhi, or just a, a struggle for civil rights as we had in the MLK. Nonviolence is no more just discussed at the national level, but it's discussed in its international application uh, uh, as a principle for uh, democratization of uh, the global, global uh, world, I would say. So from a non a violent point of view, to engage in politics would be to act in, uh, in a civic role, in a morally conscientious and socially responsible manner. And I think that nonviolence is related to these two concepts. It's practically impossible to think about nonviolent thinkers, nonviolent uh, struggles without thinking about the concept of responsibility and without thinking about moral conscience. Uh, they have been closely related, and most of these thinkers of nonviolence, most of the nonviolent activists, either religious or secular, they believe in the twin, I would say, the twin uh, politics and ethical imperatives, the twin imperatives going together, political imperative and ethical imperative going together. So, this, I think, is a very important moment to talk about this. Of course, uh, uh, more recently even, I, as I said, uh, the movements in the Middle East, especially which were uh, completely political movements, they showed us again that the ethical somehow, the ethical imperative can become a very important imperative in changing the political paradigm and to mobilize people to uh, seize uh, moral legitimacy against a dict dictatorial government and at the same time to use their courage and uh, truthfulness to confront uh, tyranny. And this is what in my vocabulary and in a book that I've written which will be published by Harvard University Press, uh, I call it the Gandhi moment. Uh, it's the Gandhi moment which is at the root uh, of a new way of thinking uh, about uh, the dominant political views that we have in today's world, and in 20, especially in 21st century, and especially about the relationship between the private and the public. How 
could we change the age-old divide between private and public? That was sanctified, theorized, sanctified by modern liberal thinkers uh, like Benjamin Constant, for example, in France, or uh, blessed by American and French revolutionaries. Uh, and uh, we just practice it today, especially in the modern world, and, and especially in the Western world. Now, uh, reading Gandhi again was very important for me. I would say just a few words, and I go back again to the, uh, our contemporary issues. Uh, reading Gandhi and bringing Gandhi in this equation was very important. Why? Because Gandhi not only applied civil disobedience and non-cooperation as strategies, but he also thought of a new approach to the problem of the question of civilization. Uh, civilization not as a scientific and technical progress of humanity, but as a moral progress of humanity, which I think is a very interesting reading of civilization. Uh, it's not, we cannot consider ourselves as being civilized just because we have uh, supersonic jets or we have nuclear uh, bombs. Uh, for people like Gandhi, it's more uh, what's inside us which shows us if we are civilized or not, which is actually the question of ethics and the question of morality. He linked to this, actually, for somebody like Gandhi and followed by Martin Luther King and others, is a question of the uh, empowerment again, but also a question of self-governing citizenship. You know, if, if we lose this capacity of self-governing citizenship, though we think that we have supercomputers and now uh, an iPad 4 and tomorrow iPad 10 or I don't know what kind of mobile phones, it, it's, it's, it comes to zero. Because you are going to have a new brain world, uh, as Aldous Huxley used to say, with uh, very simple, I mean, uh, very uh, techni technically oriented uh, mobile phones and computers, but they don't, uh, persons, individuals who do not have anymore this capacity of self government as citizens. Meaning, what Gandhi used to say, they don't have self reliance anymore. Uh, now, what uh, did Gandhi, what did Gandhi mean by that? Well, he meant when since. We have been writing as political scientists so many books about good governance. Good governance in uh, nonviolent terms would be shared governance. Okay? And it's not necessarily just to think to give power to a few individuals in Ottawa, Washington, or Paris and thinking that that's good <coughs> governance. Uh, Gandhi asserted the inseparability of nonviolence as political resistance and nonviolence as a democratic construction. Uh, it's nonviolence is not only when we're fighting against tyranny, but it's also when we're constructing democracies. So that's why he did talk about constructive program. So here I think that uh, nonviolence actually and especially fought by individuals like Gandhi, MLK and others, uh, bring us a paradigm shift in our political views, in the ways we look at politics in general, and at the foundations of uh, the political in, in today's world. Uh, for Gandhi, actually, and for MLK, uh, maturity, actually, when we talk about political maturity, when we talk about individual maturity, is closely related to self-examination. What Socrates already talked about 26 centuries ago as uh, uh, self-examined life, <coughs> self-examination. This is the foundation of uh, political uh, maturity. And so uh, the core of nonviolence, nonviolent philosophy would not be necessarily uh, to uh, make a separation between the citizen and the state, but actually to think of the duty of the citizen more than I would say the, only the responsibility of the state. And if, if the citizen is somehow sovereign, 
and it's because uh, there is an inversion of the common idea that uh, sovereignty, uh, I mean, the citizen is not only uh, supposed to obey the states and the laws of the states, but also to somehow empower oneself and to be sovereign. But to be sovereign in this sense meant, means actually being responsible, simply being responsible. So uh, I think that uh, here we are dealing with a new approach which goes uh, against uh, the Hobbesian political authority as we know it in modernity, which requires citizens under certain uh, conditions uh, to obey the state, to obey the laws, just because they have to survive and to uh, somehow get rid of their fear of uh, the destruction of the society and the state. And uh, I think at this point, uh, what becomes very, very important is that mm, somebody like Gandhi followed again by other thinkers of nonviolence, they come and they talk about spiritualizing politics, bringing how to bring ethics into politics. Now, I, I think that when we're talking about spiritualization of politics, we have to be very careful, especially in the 21st century, and especially after 9-11, because we are not talking about politicizing religion. They are not talking about politicizing religion. They are talking about ethicalizing politics. <laughs> That's different, you know? But ethics for most of these nonviolent thinkers is actually also a spiritual way of life. Spiritual, which doesn't mean necessarily you have to be religious, but it means that you have to have moral foundation, give a moral foundation to your actions and in your daily life. So it's, uh, in practically uh, all the writings and you know, all, all their actions, starting from Tolstoy and Henry David Thoreau, ending with, uh, uh, I would say, Aung San Suu Kyi and Václav Havel, you have a critique of organized religion. But you also have a critique of, uh, of the state uh, as an authority. Uh, as an authority which uses coercion, actually, to coerce the, the citizens. So I think it's important to understand that uh, we're talking about, when we're talking about global uh, nonviolent movements, all these movements, once again, they are, they are trying to ethicalize politics in their different contexts, either in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, in uh, West Asia, in South Asia, or uh, in the Middle East. And uh, it's, uh, they are not trying only to check power, because we have a tendency when we write about them as saying, well, since they are fighting against tyranny, they, they want only to have checks and balances and to check power and oppose. But they're also showing us in new ways of looking at politics and also at looking at nonviolence as a way of life. I think this is very important. Now, very quickly, as uh, some of you might know, because you might have been the readers of some of these nonviolent thinkers, in, in nonviolent uh, theory, we distinguish between uh, what we call a principle nonviolence or philosophical nonviolence and what we call the pragmatic nonviolence. Uh, principle or Philosophical nonviolence is actually the Gandhian type of nonviolence that we find also in MLK and Dalai Lama. Uh, and it's usually ethically based or religiously based. And it's, it's practically, pre it somehow presents itself as a way of life. Okay, nonviolence as a way of life. Now we have some sacred texts and some philosophical texts from the antiquity up to now, which become very, uh, I would say, paradigmatic texts, like we have uh, Socrates, uh, the Apology of Socrates, we have uh, Sermon on the Mount of Jesus Christ, we have the teaching of the Buddha, uh, and uh, up to Tolstoy and Gandhi and Martin Luther King, these are all principles, because they actually try to somehow take out these principles of action from the principle, the philosophical principles and foundations that they believe in. But we also have the pragmatic views, 
which are practiced uh, quite often, and here in Canada, for example, for those of the, uh, uh, I would say, civil liberties associations or uh, civic actors, most of them, they don't, might not know about these philosophies and these religious backgrounds, but they practice the pragmatic nonviolence, uh, like uh, demonstrations, hunger strikes, you know, picketing, uh, just name it, many, many things. And, and this is what Gene Sharp calls, actually, the pragmatic nonviolence, uh, which is um, not necessarily related to a, uh, not necessarily related to a faith, based uh, uh, philosophy, or it's not necessarily related to any kind of religion, but it's a kind of a knowing how to practice certain strategies to fight against uh, arbitrary power or uh, any form of uh, domination. Okay, now, two questions I think uh, motivate us, and two questions which motivated actually uh, Gandhi, and uh, these are the questions which are our questions uh, today. Uh, first, uh, the question of the Gandhi moment of politics to an act of dissent and resistance to the sovereign, uh, I would say, to arbitrary power, which um, I can qualify as the idea of shared sovereignty. That's one point which is very important. Secondly, is the question of the conditions and principles which enable this moment, I would say, Gandhi moment of politics or this nonviolent moment of politics to emerge and endure at the uh, global uh, level. They are both very, very important for our understanding of, uh, of our participation as citizens in the making of uh, democracies or what I call democratizing democracies making democracies more democratic. That's also uh, one of the points which uh, is very, very important. Uh, here, I think that one of the issues which have been brought up by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and others is, uh, is the concept of revolution of values. Is what Martin Luther King calls revolution of values. Revolution of values, I think, is as important as a political revolution. We have a tendency, especially since the French Revolution, uh, to talk about revolution in terms of politics and the political. But actually, uh, what is more important for nonviolent think uh, thought is ethical revolution, moral revolution, more than I would say political revolution, because. A, a political revolution without a moral and ethical foundation might, as we have seen it in French, Russian, Cuban, Chinese, Iranian revolutions, turn again into new forms of dictatorship and new forms of tyranny. Uh, so revolution of values is exactly what is the most important. And actually it's also important not only in dictatorships and tyrannies, they are also important in, uh, in our democracies. And this is why in the 1950s and 1960s, you have somebody like MLK, who in his famous speech in Washington in 1963, I have a dream, he comes and says, we are here to cash our check. This is his own words. We are here to cash a check. What is the check? It's a check of democracy he's talking about. Uh, people are there to cash their check of American democracy. And he continues by saying, well, because the founding fathers of America, when they were writing the Declaration of Independence, uh, for them, they were talking about justice and they were talking about equality, but it was not meant to be a distinction between white and black. Okay? So we are here to demand we are also part of this American democracy, and actually we want even to take it further, further uh, down in history. So I, I do believe that uh, it's very important to understand that the value of nonviolent revolution is linked closely to the uh, revolution of values itself. And revolution of values, in one word, what does it mean? Well, it means 
emerging from immaturity and accessing towards a new form of consciousness and a new strategy for change. <coughs> as simple as that. This is not, it's not very simple, but the wording is quite simple. <laughs> and so, uh, coming back to, con to the contem our contemporary world, I think that in the nonviolent movement, the first place, the first place is given to cultural creation. Cultural creation is not going and exhibiting actually your paintings. I'm not thinking of that. Cultural creation is to create values. I mean by that, creating values, creating concepts. It's an effort of creating, creative thinking. An alternative way of action which necessitates necessarily to over, overcome our philosophical, religious, and political limitations and uh, not create pragmatic uh, limits to our thinking. And I think the key to what we should understand by nonviolent creative intervention in our contemporary society is closely related to critical understanding of the nature of the contemporary crisis. Now, and this is very challenging, and I will see it through your question as I hope. The real crisis has nothing to do with the financial crisis. It is in relation with the present model of our society. The crisis of contemporary society is mainly due to the excessive overplaying of the importance of material values of life and consequent downplaying of other values like the ethical, the aesthetic, and the spiritual. These three values have been completely uh, downplayed by the material values and especially by capitalism, I would say, and technical values, the ethics, aesthetics, and spirituality. And we can call this, uh, I would call it, uh, a rise of mediocrity. Rise of mediocrity in our contemporary societies where citizens cease to call their social and political institutions into question. There is no more questioning because there is no more critical thinking. And as such, the role of the institutions is taken for granted among uh, us citizens uh, of the modern world. And uh, there is no self-reflection that calls the institutions itself into question. And in reality, another dimension of this crisis uh, at the individual level this time, and not so, so, so social level, is the steep rise in the right consciousness along with the steeper decline in the duty consciousness. We have a tendency always to talk about our rights. Uh, this is my right, this is my individual right, this is my right, as this, as that. But we all forget our duties, that rights go hand in hand with duties, and that's exactly what Gandhi used to talk about, which was very, very important. Therefore, I think the lack of social consciousness and social cohesiveness are the major features of the contemporary uh, crisis. Well, uh, in reality, uh, the common citizen of the modern world, who in theory is the sovereign actually in the democracy, or he is defined as sovereign democracy, is forced to remain helpless uh, and sometimes mute spectator uh, to all the mechanisms that he or she is observing, like technical mechanisms, market mechanisms, uh, all this dominant rationality, I would say, of uh, today's uh, world. And there is an increasing apathy and lack of interest for the social fabric of the society, which shows itself in the absence of the communitarian life as a positive, but also as a proactive form of socialization. And as a result, what happens? The entire educational process of the individual in our societies finds itself void of two central questions. One, how are we living together? And second, what are we living together for? 
how are we living together and what are we living together for? Are we living just together to come and listen to my lecture or are we, do we have a name in life? Why are we living together and how are we living together? And all this evidently brings us to the problem of the self-representation of the contemporary society and its incapacity to ask questions, ask ethical questions, ask political questions, ask social questions. Uh, all these, I think, has, has become very, very important. Why? Because let's turn to the political. The two most devalued words in our society today are politics and politicians. <laughs> Political pursuit has become a, a kind of manipulation uh, for grabbing power and using it for selfish and partisan ends. And so citizens around the world, they are not, they are not confident to, in politicians' aims and they, they, they think that politics is a matter of corruption for everybody. And, but actually, politics is a matter of responsibility of citizens. I mean, it has always been, uh, and not necessarily enforcement of law, enforcement of the state, and other forms of uh, uh, enforcement. So, responsibility of every citizen to question the political, this, this is what is completely inexistent uh, in today's world. Another thing, uh, if we go back to this Gandhian reading of nonviolence, I would say that the real test of democracy is not merely empowering a victorious majority, as we think, uh, around the world, uh, but uh, it consists in a new attitude and approach towards the problem, problem of power itself and the problem of violence. That's the, the question of democracy, is to, to ask questions about power itself, not to think that we bring one majority or one political party to, to power and it's going, this is what democracy is all about. What I mean is that democratic governance is not a power over the society, but a power within the society. There's a difference between power over the society and power within the society. So, to make it short, I would say democracy and non-violence non are inseparable. Uh, if you're thinking in terms of democracy and democratization, you have to think also in terms of nonviolence. And so the question, I go back to my initial question, how do we democratize democracies? This is our problem in Canada. And how are we to reconcile the twin convictions that there can be no democracy unless state-centered power is limited, and there can be no democracy without the pursuit of nonviolence? the twin convictions? Well, the answer to these questions, I think, resides in the definition of nonviolence itself. Nonviolence as a common responsibility. Let me define, give, give you a new definition also. I, I've been defining it se separately, different ways. Common responsibility. Common responsibility in all departments of life. Economic, political, ethical, social, aesthetic, I would say, all skills of life. And therefore, nonviolent action is not only about an act of resisting power, as we see it around the world, but demonstrating for justice and equality, uh, which, is, which becomes very, very, I would say, more even more important. And we should not forget that the essence of peace, which is also linked closely with nonviolence, is the daily effort of civic responsibility. How can we be fight for peace and against forms of war and violence if we don't have this permanent civic responsibility? And because the essence of peace is a continuous struggle against the nature of violence itself. It's not just against uh, this first world war or second world war. It's against the nature of violence itself at all levels. Say, and that's the most important. Now to finish and to conclude, because I think uh, we have to start uh, having a debate together, and uh, I hope that there are going to be some challenging questions from your side, uh, and I will be very happy to answer them. Uh, let me say that 
Another uh, issue, uh, if I take it epistemologically or philosophically, another issue which is very important in approaching the problem of nonviolence as a mode of thought, as a mode of action, would be what I call epistemic and moral humility. Uh, if, you, if we are not, epistem epistem we don't have moral humility and epistemic humility, we cannot have a nonviolent approach to others. It's because uh, this humility gives us the possibility of empathy, the possibility of understanding the other, the possibility of, even if the other is wrong, to persuade the other to that it is wrong. If we have a dominant, dom you know, this uh, ish, um, position of dominating the other, uh, and wanting to dominate the other, uh, either among sexes, or among races, or among nations, or among individuals, uh, you will never have this nonviolent approach. It's always domination is always linked with all forms of violence, of course, and uh, that's why it's uh, very important not to have this epistemic humility. But uh, also, uh, what is also very important is to understand that when we're talking about nonviolence action or nonviolent change in the world, uh, this means we have to struggle against all forms of selfish, individualistic, uh, and uncivil forms of disobedience. I think that we have to distinguish between uh, what we call civil disobedience in the language of nonviolence and uncivil disobedience. Not all forms of rebellion and rebelliousness in the forms of what I call the James Dean syndrome, you know, the rebels without cause, Elia Kazan, you know, some kind of the delinquency or uh, any form of, uh, you know, being re rebellious without cause, without principles, is nonviolence. That's not nonviolence. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, it should be, uh, any form uh, of nonviolence should be ethical, and it should have as aim uh, to change the society, uh, I think, in totality. And that's also what becomes, that makes it so important. And uh, last but not least, <coughs> we should not forget that nonviolent action is used mostly these days on grassroots level, uh, when people need to go on the streets and to achieve a goal. But uh, I was telling the, the Toronto campaign uh, a few months ago, uh, like the Wall Street campaign, you know, uh, I was telling them demonstrating and going to the parks and sit-ins and boycotting is not enough. You have to have principles to do that behind it, because otherwise you will, at some point, it's going to end. And you don't know how, because you don't know what you're struggling for. And you have to have a, a new philosophy of the world. You have to have a new approach towards ethical questions, towards political questions. Uh, uh, otherwise, it's, it's very easy to uh, accuse you of violence or accuse you of, uh, of uh, uh, unrightfulness against other citizens. And uh, it's, it's not because you call yourself occupying occupation, occupying Toronto or occupying Wall Street that you necessarily are fighting against uh, capitalism or you are necessarily fighting against the structures of the political world today. So I think that nonviolent campaigns are collective, uh, collective efforts and they need civic consciousness. They cannot function without <coughs> civic consciousness. Uh, it's very, very important. It's not because there's some kind of hero who appears suddenly in Iran or in Syria or elsewhere and says, well, I want to have a movement that we necessarily have to accept and run after this personality. Uh, because we need to have maturity and we need to have uh, civic consciousness. And finally, uh, uh, I think that we have to uh, mention the fact that uh, we are all embarked uh, on the same global road, and that each one of us have what we can do uh, has repercussions on everyone else's actions. Uh, so we cannot say, I don't think we can say, what history will decide, 
but we can maintain certainly our judgment and our responsibility and also recognize people's autonomy as the limit of our uh, nonviolent strategy. And I think this is why nonviolence belongs to the future of uh, our world and uh, not only to its past. Thank you very much.